Good morning. The scripture reading for this morning is Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 25. It's Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 25. If you're using a pew Bible, the verses are found on pages 36 and 37 in the New Testament. Hear the word of the Lord. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples were listening. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, It is not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you have made it a robber's den. The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him. For they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they would go out of the city, and as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Oh, good morning. Again, we are returning to the Gospel of Mark uh, for the next two weeks uh, as I continue to preach through the Gospel of Mark with this particular focus on the sandwiches that Mark provides the reader. This is a unique literary tool that Mark uses in his Gospel to highlight what it means to have faith in Christ and to follow him as a disciple. I believe that Mark uses these sandwiches to draw our attention to essential features of the gospel, namely faith in the Son of God and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I know this will be review for some, but when we're talking about the sandwiches in Mark, we're talking about places in the gospel where Mark uh, begins a narrative, uh, interrupts it with a teaching or another story, and then finishes the narrative he started, as you heard in the reading of the fig tree. I believe, along with other scholars and commentators, that Mark does this to ensure that we interpret the narrative through the correct lens. Mark goes to great lengths throughout his gospel to draw our attention to moments or activities in Jesus' life that are profound meanings to the life, work, and ministry of Jesus the Messiah. Uh, One of the basic rules of biblical interpretation is letting Scripture interpret Scripture. This means that when a passage is not clear to us, we let the rest of the scriptures speak into that passage, and it guides us in our interpretation. Um, Here is how the uh, 1689 Confession talks about this rule of interpretation. The infallible rule for interpreting scripture is the scripture itself. Therefore, when there is a question about the true and full meaning of any part of scripture, which is not manifold, but one, it must be searched by other places that speak more clearly. I'd argue that um, we are breaking this rule if we come to a passage like the cursing of the fig tree, which is our text today, and interpret its meaning while neglecting the rest of Scripture. 
To say this more clearly, we must let Mark's construction of this passage be the means we use to interpret it correctly. This means that a passage can't just mean what we want it to mean. This means we can't come up with an interpretation of a passage in which it contradicts other passages of the Scripture, and it means that we must interpret Scripture with Scripture. With all this said, I'd argue that the very structure of Mark's uh, sandwiches in the gospel is God's means of using his own principle. Because of Mark's structure to these passages, he is requiring we interpret these narratives in a particular way. And in relation to our passage, Jesus' cleansing of the temple and um, his teaching in the temple is the filter through which uh, we should interpret the cursing of the fig tree. Would you pray with me as we ask the Lord for his guidance as we dig into his word this morning? Father, would you stir up the soil in our hearts to receive your word? Lord, that we would produce a bountiful crop in the hearing of your word. Would you grant us eyes to see and ears to hear what you would have from us in this text? Would we see the glory of Christ? Would we see the humanity of Christ? Would we see this weighty text as a, as a warning, but also as a call and an exhortation for us who call ourselves disciples to walk in a, in a manner that is pleasing to you? May we not be like Israel and Jerusalem in this text when, when Christ expected to find true worship in the temple and he found none. Lord, would you help us to see the message you have for us in this text from this withered fig tree in Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin with just a quick recap of the passages we've walked through already in this manner. Uh, sandwich number one was Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35, and these are just going to be like bullet points, just a sentence or two, unpacking the main points of each of these other sandwiches we've worked through. So the first one was Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. This is where we saw that the true family of God are those that do the will of God. The true family of God sees Jesus as the Son of God. Those sitting at the feet of Jesus are the true family of God. Then in sandwich number two, this was Mark chapter four, verses one through 20. The secret of the kingdom is given to Jesus' disciples. The same word is given to all, but only those who have been given eyes to see will see that Jesus is king. Those who have truly heard the word accept it and bear fruit. Sandwich number three, this was in Mark chapter five, verses 21 through 43. Salvation is by faith. There is nothing too hard for God. Jesus calls for unflinching faith even in the face of death. Jesus calls for us to put our faith in him, for he can even raise the dead, and there is no uncleanness in us that Christ cannot wipe away. Faith in Christ, faith in Jesus, even conquers death. And then sandwich number four was Mark uh, chapter 6, verse 7 through 30, which was about the cost of discipleship. Jesus' Jesus' disciples will succeed in the mission for which Christ has sent them. Jesus has sent out his disciples for ministry. God will provide for his disciples, and the ultimate cost of discipleship could be martyrdom, as we saw in the unpacking of John's beheading. All of these teachings or realities are essential to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. These sandwiches leave open a question for each reader. Each of them has a question for us. Are you a part of God's family? Have you heard the word of God, responded, and received the secret of the kingdom in Jesus Christ? Is your faith unflinching regardless of the situation? Have you considered that following Jesus may cost you your life? The question that we will be left with after we work through this passage over the next two weeks is, does the fruit of your life match your confession? that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You'll notice from the title of this sermon that fruitless discipleship is not a category for Christ. This week we'll be looking at the seriousness of fruitful, uh, fruitlessness in the lives of those confessing faith in Christ that they may even appear to be living obediently. Next week we'll be looking more closely at the fruit that Christ expects in his disciples so we come to this passage in Mark, and we are quickly hit with some very unique features to the text. 
And let me start by drawing a few of these features out. First, Jesus is hungry. He sees a fig tree with leaves, and when he reaches the tree, he realizes it does not have any fruit on it. If Jesus is God, why did he have to approach the tree to see if there would be anything on it? Shouldn't he have already known that this tree did not have any fruit on it before approaching it? The next question, Mark says in verse 13 that it was not the season for figs. Wouldn't a man who had grown up in Galilee, 30 years at least, known when figs would be expected on the tree? Or another question, if it was not the season for figs, why would Jesus curse this fig tree for not producing fruit? This seems harsh. The tree shouldn't have had fruit on it because it was not the season for figs. Yet Jesus curses it anyways. And I'm going to argue that these questions are very appropriate for us to be asking of the text because we, when we ask these questions of the text, it makes it, clear, it makes it clear to what Jesus is trying to show us and teach his disciples through this miracle. And I want to point out just one more feature about this text that makes the cursing of the fig tree a completely unique miracle. Nowhere else in Jesus' ministry, as portrayed in the Gospels, do we find Jesus destroying creation. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is healing, he's saving, he's restoring, he's releasing people from the effects of the curse. In, in, in our text this morning, we have Jesus cursing and destroying a part of his creation. Watched a few uh, engagements with Christians and Muslims actually on this text. Uh, Muslims will use this text to prove that Jesus is not God because he was hungry and because he came to a tree, though it, didn't, uh, though it was not the time of figs. If he was God, he would have known that uh, there was no fruit on this tree. Now, we need to stop at this moment. When we have apparent difficulties in any text, any text in Scripture, we must use the rest of Scripture to interpret Scripture. This is that rule we just read from the Baptist Confession and a rule that we see in Scripture itself. All of Scripture is breathed out by God. This is 2 Timothy 3.16, which means when we have a difficult text, we let the rest of the Scriptures help us interpret this text. So in the opening scene of our text, Jesus is traveling from Bethany back to Jerusalem. In verse 11 of Mark chapter 11, so the verse preceding our text, we learn that Jesus had been in Jerusalem the day before, ended up staying over and then staying overnight in Bethany. Mark, uh, Mark in chapter 11 records Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jerusalem has just received their king. In the opening verses of Mark chapter 11, Jerusalem has just received their Messiah, the king that would sit on David's throne forever. We are in the final week of Jesus' life. And in less than one week's time, this Messiah that was received in to Jerusalem as a king would be hung on a cross and killed. And in less than one week's time, Israel would receive their king, the true offspring of David, that would sit on the throne forever. This is 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verse 16. And then reject him as they hung him on a cross for crimes he did not commit. So Jesus enters Jerusalem. And after arriving, he comes to the temple and looks around at everything that is going on. This is Mark chapter 11, verse 11. These details are important for us as they set up our text. Jesus had inspected the temple before he returned and began addressing all of the sin that had been taking place in his father's house. Jesus very pur purposefully inspects the temple and returns to clear it from all the abuses and to exhort and rebuke them with the scriptures for the condition of the temple. We learn in Mark chapter 11 that after Jesus arrived and inspected the temple, it was already late, and he made his way back to Bethany to spend the night. Bethany was about two miles from the city of Jerusalem, so it was about a 40-mile walk or so. And in John chapter 1, Bethany is the place that we find John the Baptist uh, baptizing people in his ministry. This is also the place uh, where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived, and it is the place that Lazarus himself was, was raised from the dead. And it is where Jesus will be anointed before his crucifixion. Now let us return to the fig tree. The main question we need to answer from this text is what was Jesus' purpose for cursing the fig tree? 
As we consider this event in the Gospel of Mark, I would argue Mark makes this very unique and even confusing narrative clear. Mark does not leave us without a precise answer to that question. So let me give you the answer and then show you with the remainder of our time today and next week why this is the answer as I see it. So Jesus curses the fig tree in front of his disciples to foreshadow the coming judgment on Israel for their rejection of the Messiah. Jesus curses the fig tree to reveal to his disciples that whoever rejects Jesus will experience the same outcome as the fig tree. Jesus curses the fig tree to serve as a prophetic foreshadowing of God, removing his blessing from Israel and giving it to a nation that will produce its fruit. That's Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. So this is a heavy text. The implications of the withered tree are serious. The reality of God's coming judgment is on full display. The totality of Jesus' judgment on sin is on full display. I hope you're starting to feel the weight of this text, not just for what Jesus is saying about his people in Jerusalem in this text, but about every disciple that is not producing fruit. We are not understanding the totality of Jesus' ministry if we ignore the hard truths of this text. If what Jesus is teaching his disciples through the withering of the fig tree does not convict us and change us, we have not heard the text rightly. We are like the scribes in Jesus' biological family in Mark chapter 3 that thought Jesus was out of his mind or even doing the work of Satan. We're like the soils in Mark chapter 4 that did not hear and accept the word but were choked out and did not produce any fruit. So if we come away from this text and our faith is not strengthened or the nearness of God is not felt, we have not heard this text rightly. So just as we saw in the parable of the sower and the different conditions of the soil, those that are not able to hear the message of the fig tree have not entered the kingdom and have not received the secret of the kingdom. It is only those who have been given eyes to see and ears to hear that will be able to understand the parable of the fig tree, which is what Jesus, which is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is God in flesh. He came to his own people and they did not receive him. He is the Davidic king that God promised that would remain on the throne forever. He is the priest that will forever intercede for his people. And he is the final prophet by which God has spoken to his people. And just like Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, we see in this text that Jesus is a prophet, priest, and king as he is presented in our text this morning. We read that. God, having spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets and in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he spoke to us um, in his Son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact uh, representation of his nature and upholds all things by the power, uh, by the word of his power, and who, having accomplished cleansing for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The main point of this passage in Mark is for us to see Christ as the Messiah, who will bring righteous judgment on all those that reject him. And the irony of this text is that the same people that received him as king just a few verses earlier will be the same people that hang him on the cross. The very people that received him as king but refuse to cling to him as the curse-bearing, suffering servant will wither under his judgment, just like the fig tree, if they remain in their unbelief. The message of the fig tree is serious, it is weighty, but those that are able to hear its message and of this fig tree will be the ones that produce much fruit. So let me come back to the first question we asked of this text. If Jesus is God, why did he have to approach the tree to see if there'd be any fruit on it? And maybe a similar question, if Jesus is God, why was he hungry? These questions are stumbling block for Muslims. Listen to a few of these interviews this past week. They're stumbling blocks for those that are not able to see the text in its entirety and refuse to use the rest of Mark's gospel 
and the scripture to interpret this passage. First, we must see in this text that in verses 12 through 14, Jesus puts on display his humanity and his deity. You cannot suggest this text proves his humanity because he was hungry or that he lacked, uh, I'm sorry, you can't use this text to suggest that this doesn't point to his deity because he was hungry or that he lacked knowledge of the fig tree. When in verse 20, the fig tree was withered to its roots because of Jesus' spoken word of curse. And as we'll see clearly next week, um, this authority in the temple as well. So Jesus speaks to the tree in verse 14, a word of curse. And when his disciples are leaving Jerusalem later that day, they see the effect of this curse. The tree had withered down to its roots. Now, if we're being honest with the text, we cannot use this text to prove that Jesus was simply a man and ignore uh, that he has the ability with the word to curse a fig tree and cause it to wither. And I was, as I was learning about little, literal fig trees this week, it was mentioned in one place that it could take up to seven to ten days because of how much water is in these trees for it to become completely dry. So the tree withers immediately in our text. And I think about um, when Jesus changes water into wine, time and external factors don't impact Christ's word even. This text clearly holds up the humanity and deity of Jesus. Mark makes the reading of this passage more difficult when he mentions that Jesus curses the fig tree for not having fruit on it. When he says the, free, the fig tree didn't have fruit on it because it wasn't um, time or the season for figs. Mark makes that difficult. And when, our, um, when the books do this, this is important for us to take notice. And some commentaries go in different directions on these details. Some suggest that it is clear based on the description of this fig tree that it was er still early in the season and there shouldn't have been any fruit. And Jesus would have known this and he cursed the tree anyways. Some, some suggest this was a healthy, fruit, uh, fruitful fig tree, and healthy, fruitful fig trees, that's a lot of Fs, um, have two harvests in a good season. The fig tree, when it starts to put out leaves, will have some first fruits that are edible, um, they're a little tart, and, will have a, uh, and then later have a greater harvest later in the season, if the season is long enough. So the pre-fruit of the fig tree um, that are edible, and maybe this is what Jesus was looking for. But based on Mark chapter 13, verse 28, we know um, also that when the fig tree puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So we know from the scriptures that Jesus is showing up to a tree with its leaves, as it says in our text, which means summer is near, so late spring. So Jesus shows up to this fig tree expecting something to eat. I take the harder reading. I think he knew when he showed up to the tree there wouldn't be any fruit on it which would have been unlikely. <clears throat> so the miracle was not really about the physical tree not having fruit on it. So what do I mean? I mean Mark specifically mentions the fact that it was early in the fig season such that Jesus knew when he showed up to the tree, it would not relieve him of his hunger. We must also not forget that Jesus had just been at the temple and he was on his way back from the temple. Mark does not want us to miss the spiritual nature of Jesus' curse on this tree, uh, the curse of this tree, which is why he specifically tells us that it was not the season for figs. Jesus shows up at the fig tree, which is not supposed to have fruit, and curses it for not having fruit. So the point of this passage is not about the nature of this tree. The point of this passage is what this tree represents. We do not know the outcome of this tree in Mark's account until after Jesus returns from teaching and clearing the temple in Jerusalem. In the Gospel of Mark, it mentions it, it explicitly withers in front of them. Mark holds off that detail until their return. But Mark does not want us to miss what this fig tree is really about, which is why Mark inserts Jesus' temple cleansing before finishing the narrative. The fig tree is about Jesus, God in the flesh coming to inspect his temple the place where a true fruit of worship ought to be most clear. But when Jesus visits the temple, he sees the sins of his people for himself. Did Christ know the sins of his people and the sins of the world prior to, prior to his incarnation? He did. Did Christ know the sins of his people and the sins of this world before his incarnation? Yes, he did. 
Did Christ know the condition of the temple prior to showing up to it yet a second time and cleaning it out in our passage? Yes, Jesus came to the temple, the place where God's presence should have been most evident, and what did he find? He found the practice of worship. He found a facade of worship. He found partiality. He found robbers. He found false teaching. He found people trying to personally gain from the worship of God. He didn't find prayer. He didn't find true teaching. He didn't find people with hearts full of worship, but people with hearts seeking their own personal gain. So in the sermon next week, this is where we're going to focus our, intention, focus our attention, where Jesus unpacks in this uh, text the type of fruit he expects from true worshipers. So we will answer the question next week, what type of fruit did Je does Jesus expect from his, from his disciples? What fruit should be on the tree of our lives? So let us return to the picture of the fig tree. It is meant to convey, convey to his disciples and to the people that believing they are following Christ, but are not bearing any fruit. As many of you are aware and have joined us for our study of biblical theology for the last year or so, you are aware that there are themes and patterns and shadows that run from Genesis to Revelation. Throughout redemptive history, God reveals himself to us in these patterns and shadows and themes, and we're meant to see these connections. So as God has worked through history to bring salvation to the world, he speaks to us in these shadows and themes and patterns in order to communicate deep truths about himself to us. One of the themes we see in scripture is that God speaks about his people using metaphors. To name just a few, we are the clay, he is the potter. We are his sheep, he is our shepherd. He is a husband and we are his wife. God's people are a fig tree. He is a gardener. And I hope you're seeing where we're going with this. Throughout the Old Testament, fig trees are used to describe different facets of God's blessing or the condition of Israel's relationship with God. So let's consider a few of these passages. The first one, Jeremiah 24, verses 1 through 8. Then the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, like these, good, like these good figs, so I will recognize as good the exiles of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the uh, Chaldeans. For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will return to them this land, and I will build them up and not pull them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me, for I am Yahweh, and they, they will be my people, and I will be their God, and they will return to me with their whole heart. But like the rotten figs, which cannot be eaten due to rottenness, indeed, thus says Yahweh, so I will give over Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials, and the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land, and the ones who inhabit the land of Egypt. In this passage, it is very clear that God uses the figs of a fig tree to describe the judgment and blessing that is coming on God's people in the book of Jeremiah. Now listen to Hosea chapter 9, verse 10 found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the earliest fruit on the fig tree in its first season, but they came to Baal Peor and devoted themselves to shame, and they became as detestable as that which they loved. In these passages, we see God comparing his relationship with his people as a fig tree and its fruit. There's also another way that figs or fig trees are used in the scriptures. The presence of figs in several passages are used to describe the Lord's blessing on his people and their land. Figs are used to describe a land and people that are blessed by the Lord. Consider these passages, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 through 10. For Yahweh our God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you, where you will eat without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And so you will eat and be satisfied, and you shall bless Yahweh your God for the good land which he has given you. Fig trees are used to describe a land of blessing, of plenty, of fruitfulness. Or 
How about the lack of fig trees as part of God's judgment in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17? I heard, and in my inward parts, they trembled at the sound of my lips. They tingled. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble because I must wait quietly for the days of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us, though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no produce on the vines, though the yield of the olive oil should fail, and the fields yield no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in Yahweh. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. We see in these, in these texts or in this text that fig trees not blossoming and no produce on vines represent God's coming judgment and his removing his blessing. Now, we don't have more time for texts, but there are more like this. And with these samples, we can see that God uses figs and fig trees to describe his blessing on his people and their land. But he also uses the fig tree to describe the relationship with his people and the type of fruit that they are producing. There's also another, another allusion to fig leaves in the scriptures that I think is important to draw your attention to in this last section. So let me start here with a question. Where is the first place in the scriptures that fig leaves are described to us? In Genesis chapter 3. God came into the garden to look for Adam and Eve after they had sinned, and he ends up making them better clothing. And this clothing was made out of animal skins. But it was the fig leaves that Adam and Eve used to cover themselves as they realized they were naked. Listen to serials um, from Jerusalem's commentary on our text in Mark. Oh, thank you. Remember at the time of the sin, Adam and Eve, they clothed themselves with what? Fig trees. That was their first act after the fall. So now Jesus is making the same figure of the fig tree, the very last of his wondrous signs. Just as he was headed towards the cross, he cursed the fig tree, not every fig tree, but that one alone for its symbol significant saying, may no one ever eat fruit of you again. In this way, the curse laid on Adam and Eve was being reversed, for they had clothed themselves with fig leaves. Cyril makes a couple, observation, a couple observations in Jesus' cursing of the fig tree in Mark, and the fig leaves in Genesis in the chronological order of Jesus' ministry, in fact. It should be noted that Jesus' cursing of the fig tree in Mark chapter 11 is Jesus' final miraculous act. In Jesus' final miraculous act, he destroys, he breaks down, and does not build up. Jesus, the second Adam, came to the fig tree with leaves and cursed it. God spoke creation into existence by his word, and Christ curses this tree with his word. Fig leaves were the first thing that man used to hide themselves from God. And Christ makes it clear in Mark chapter 11 that the facade of leaves on the fig tree will not be enough to hide its true nature. The true nature of the tree, the true nature of Israel and of Jerusalem will be uncovered and it will experience God's judgment. The height of man's sinfulness and our efforts to rid ourselves of God is on full display in the cross. And only a few days after Jesus' cursing of the fig tree, Christ would become the curse on behalf of his people. And it was in Israel's rejection of God and their efforts to cover themselves with the facade of true worship that reached its climax in the crucifixion of Jesus, the Son of God. And some of us, like this fig tree in Mark chapter 11, we are attempting to hide our fruitless nature. We are hoping that our leaves will cover our barrenness. And I ask you this morning, what are your leaves? What are you using to cover your sins? Just as Israel rejected their Messiah, if your desire is to remain in your sin and, to re and refuse to lay yourself bare before Christ the Lord and confess your sins, we see in the parable of this withered fig tree how Christ will respond on the day of judgment So on the day of judgment, the leaves that we use to hide ourselves from God will be pulled off and we will have no covering before the Lord. And any clothing apart from Christ 
himself will be insufficient in the presence of a holy God. So just like when God showed up in the garden, his presence, he comes into the garden to have dealings with Adam and Eve after they had sinned, the leaves were not sufficient clothing. God ended up covering them, and not with leaves, but with animal skins, which suggests the shedding of blood. And in the scriptures, we are told that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Listen to these two texts. This is Leviticus 17, uh, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Then the next passage, Romans, or I'm sorry, Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled those who have been defiled, sanctified, or sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Some of us are like this fig tree in Mark. We are hiding our true fruitless nature. We are hoping that our leaves will cover our barrenness. And if your desire is to remain in your sin and refuse to lay yourself bare before the Lord and confess your sins, we see in the parable of the fig tree in this text how Christ will respond on the day of judgment for those that have rejected him as their Messiah. There may be some here today that are outside the kingdom of God. There may be some here that do, that do not see Christ as their only hope for salvation and are clinging to their good works and their religious activities to cover the true nature of their heart. To those that are using fig leaves, good works, outward obedience, and are hiding from God, this parable has a hard word for you. There will come a day when the leaves will not cover you any longer. There will come a day when the Lord himself will inspect the tree of your life, and his law word will be the decisive blow to your life. On the day of judgment, there will be an inspection. The Lord himself will do the inspection and everything will be laid bare. Consider these next two texts. 2 Peter verses 3, 10 through 15. But according to his promise, we are looking for new, uh, new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Be on your guard, therefore, beloved, since you are looking for these things. Be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, and consider the patience of our Lord as salvation. Or the next one from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And in fact, the scriptures teach that the judgment will start at the household of God. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I'm sorry, 1 Peter 4, 17. For it is the time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? As we close here, the second Peter chapter 3 passage is a perfect segue to what this passage on the fig tree should provoke in those who have been saved those who are justified, those who are trusting in Jesus Christ alone for forgiveness of sins and for salvation, those who have passed in the kingdom of light of God's beloved Son are those that when inspected by the Lord will have fruit. On the day of judgment, God will inspect each tree for true fruit. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 15 explicitly states what type of fruit will be found, namely holiness and godliness. And the second letter of Peter opens with attitudes that will be found on those who have been truly saved. And we see in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, what true fruit looks like. We see that true disciples will grow in these things and will uh, uh, persevere 
Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in brotherly kindness, love. The parable of the withered fig tree works like the other parables, to which Mark has already explained that it is Christ's disciples that receive the word, yield to it, and obey, and bear fruit. This was made clear in Mark's second sandwich, Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. True disciples, those who have been justified, hear the warning of the withered fig tree and respond in right worship. They turn to God. They confess sin. They throw off the fig leaves, the man-made coverings, and run to Christ. They see that apart from Christ, they are under condemnation and are cursed by God. True worshipers see their nature apart from Christ. They see their barrenness. They see their sin for what it is. True worshipers cling to the cursed Messiah who hung on the tree for their sin as the only hope of their fruitfulness. Just as Mark has said in chapter 8 of his gospel, true discipleship means picking up our cross and following Jesus. It means dying to ourself. This is the meditation verse uh, in your bulletins. That apart from Christ, you can do nothing. And those that do not remain in Christ will not bear fruit. Those that are not trusting in Christ, hear the warning of this withered fig tree. And do not consider, and consider your own condition. Do not look at your own leaves the coverings that you've made for yourself and believe that they are good enough to stand before God. None of us are able to stand before God with our own coverings. The scriptures say that if we have broken just one of God's law, we have broken all of his law. The scriptures say that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So those that are not trusting in Christ will hear the parable of this withered fig tree and they will rage against Jesus. They will seek to discredit him. They will challenge him. They will do everything they can to ignore and destroy the word of God, just as the Gentiles and Jews did in the remainder of Mark's gospel. They do not heed, they do not heed God's word, and they will seek to put an end to Christ and to his people. This is where we will pick up next week. We will further unpack the nature of true worship, and we will look more, cl more closely at the type of fruit that Christ expects when he inspects our life and what he will demand on the day of judgment. And here's the last exhortation. Don't leave here today until you have identified those leaves, those fig leaves that you, have, that you are hiding behind. This could be your reputation. This could be fear of man. This could be your own wisdom. This could be your bank account. This could be pride. So if you are not trusting in Christ, do not leave here until you have turned to Christ. Our days are numbered, and none of them are guaranteed. Do not live another day apart from Christ, because there will come a day when God's open hand of salvation will be closed, and only the fearful expectation of judgment will be left. And for those that are in Christ, hear the warning and the call of Christ's inspection of his people, of his disciples and the fruit that he expects for those that are living in conformity to his will and to his desire. Now pray with me. <clears throat> Father, this is a weighty text. As your son will return in all of his glory and in power and will usher in a new heavens and a new earth and one that is full of righteousness where there will be no wickedness, where sin will not remain, Father, may for those of us trusting in Christ, may we be found to be in Christ. May he be our true covering. May through the Spirit you convict us of the areas that we are still trying to use fig leaves to cover up our blemishes and our barrenness and our unfruitfulness. Father, forgive us for the ways we have been unfruitful in the, in, in the ways that you have called us to be fruitful. May we be bold in light of the judgment that is coming and it, and it will start here at the house of God. Lord, may we feel that weight. May we, may we fear that. But 
may that fear lead to love, love towards you. And we are promised that as, you, as we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Thank you for this word, Lord, and thank you for this reminder of your expectations and that apart from your son, we can't do any of this. In Jesus' name, amen. The benediction uh, this morning comes from Jude, verses uh, 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.